Good morning, everybody. Um, as Siobhan said, I think that last session set us up very well, very nicely yeah. uh, for this one. Um, I, I think if you're going to do a panel on alternatives uh, in this region, then, then yeah. this panel is it. So let's, let's really make the most of it. And I'll, I'll come to you for some questions uh, at the end uh, as well. So the title, Alternative Energy is a Necessity, uh, not a Luxury. I think it, it does beg the question, of course, a necessity for whom? Uh, for the planet, for governments, uh, for, for business, for investors, uh, or all of the above. That's something we'll put to our panel uh, in just a second uh, as well. Let me, um, it, it's a, a formidable panel, and I'll get to them in just a second, but let me just throw out a couple of eye-popping numbers for you. More than $300 billion invested globally into clean energy last year takes the tally since 2010 to $2.5 the International Renewable Energy Agency has said that electricity from renewables will, by 2020, be consistently cheaper than from most fossil fuels. Globally, almost 7 billion people have jobs in renewables. One in 50 new jobs in the US is created uh, in the solar industry. Uh, I could uh, go on. Uh, I anticipate we're going to find somewhat of a consensus on the need for alternatives with this group here, but I think we might be able to get a little bit of debate going on the technologies uh, themselves. So I think the focus of this session is going to be on the realities, the practicalities of scaling uh, this sector. Um, let me introduce them. Um, next to me is uh, Paddy uh, Padmanathan, president and CEO of Aqua Power, the Saudi power generation company with a very big presence in solar. Dr. Mana Al Monif, the CEO for GE Renewables. Dietmar Siersdorfer, CEO of Siemens Middle East and Siemens uh, UAE. Uh, next to him, uh, is Mr. Mohammed Al Hamadi, the CEO of Emirates Nuclear Energy Corporation, uh, and on the end, um, Mr. Mohammed Al Ramahi, the CEO of Mazda. So, as I said, all the big names uh, in this space. Let me let, let me start with what we just saw on the screen. I'll come uh, to you first on this. Were you surprised that 36% of this audience still feel renewables won't move the needle? I thought 33% of the audience, uh, the, the, the majority of the audience believe that actually renewables will move the needle. Yeah, but 36% said 36. Say it Still say it won't. It's, uh, it's, it's the minority, I would say. <laughs> but the majority said it will move the needle. Yes, okay. And this is exactly what uh, uh, the UAE have realized from day one. So our country uh, realized that diversification of the economy is a must. Our country uh, also highlighted the importance, of, uh, the importance of the diversification of the energy. And I just want to give you one example. The UAE Energy Strategy 2050, almost 50% of that from clean energy. And 47% or 40, almost 40% of that is coming from renewable energy. From almost 100% 10 years ago, coming through fossil fuel energy generation, mainly gas. So it just tells you the trends in the region, the renewable energy targets are here, okay, and they are here to stay. And the renewable <coughs> energy today is a mainstream technology, and it is mainstream technology, A, because of the policies and regulations vis-a-vis -vis these countries, but B, because the efficiency of these technologies are, are much better, and the cost of the levelized cost yep. of electricity is extremely appealing to, we, the, we, uh, we, to different uh, countries around the world. So the we, demand we, is there. Yeah, apologies for interrupting. We'll, we'll, we'll come to efficiencies and costs in, in, in a moment. Just, uh, stepping back, though, to the title. Paddy, let me, let me put this to you. Why does this need to happen now? What, and, and who is it necessary for? We talk about an, a necessity. Who, who, who are we doing this for? Look, I, I, earlier on you saw it. The world is becoming electric. More and more, uh, so electricity demand, which was, good, even if we don't switch over so much with all the electric vehicles, industries switching over in electric, was already growing anyway, as uh, economies grew per capita, income grew. Uh, now it's growing at a much more fast rate. So f first thing is go, it's becoming electric. Mm. But in terms of necessity, yes, okay, we know that we need to address carbon, uh, the footprint. Uh, we need 
there is an issue around climate change. But those are the necessities. But the reality is that we don't need to worry about all of that. Renewable energy has now become the most cost competitive solution for a significant segment of the demand today. It used to be subsidized. It used to be uh, feed-in tariff led. It used to be policy driven. All of that has changed. It, the point of inflection was 2017, when all of a sudden everything changed where we are now seeing definitely the upper part of the load curve, the peak shaving. There is no other way to shave that peak more cheaply than with renewable energy. All right. And it's now starting to move into mid -merit. All right. So back to that poll. Are, are you guys then not selling the message well enough? If 36% still believe this won't move the needle, you've said the business case for this has never been better. Mano, let me, let me put that to you. I imagine you agree the business case has never been better for this, given uh, the numbers, uh, given costs, given, the, uh, given the, the sort of investment we're seeing. Is this message just not getting through? No, it is. But let's remember that the renewable business is in the infancy stage, specifically in this part of the world. So today, when you look at it from an economic perspective, the numbers are much more appealing today compared to fossil fuel in many other nations, equally in this part of the world when you remove the subsidies. And now the trend of technology, this industry is driven by technology. The ramp up and the introduction of technology on an annual basis, you cannot keep pace with the new technologies and it's changing the world. A few years ago, we were speaking about solar only. We were speaking about wind only. Today, we're speaking about hybrid. We're speaking about storage. We're speaking now that renewable can be a base load, but it's still in the infancy stage. But if you look at the ramp up of developing this industry versus what happened in the conventional, mm -hmm. I think so it's going in a very fast pace. Mm. And it's happening much more quickly Indeed. than we thought it would happen. Yes. Why, why did we, Deepma, let me ask you this. Why have we so underestimated the, the ingenuity of man, if you like, in making renewables work so well and so effectively? I think the whole industry was working very effectively on this. I mean, it, we were driven by sustainability goals at the beginning. Remember, 10, 15 years ago, it was uh, definitely CO2 uh, emission reduction, and that was driving also the, the invention and the, the rise of uh, renewables. At that time, we had very high cost. When you look at the last five years, the decline that we had in, in renewable, that was because we all worked heavily on that technology. And this we have done as well in solar, as well as in, in wind. The cost came everywhere down. So costs were driven out of the system. We had scalability also because the, the projects were getting bigger and we have in the meantime many countries in the world where we have parity of cost for example for wind turbines compared to fossil and in many cases when you look here in this region and Patty you are the, the leader in this in the region uh, you have driven costs so much that we are lower than than uh, in, in fossil fuels mm -hmm. and this is because of uh, this ingenuity was used it was not because we were lacking of ingenuity and we were not communicating it it had to be done and we also had to find the early adopters of this. There must be also customers that at the end of the day in governments that say this is what I want and this is what I adopt in my, in my country. Yeah. Okay, Patty. Sorry, just a quick one. I think uh, a bunch of coincidences. So policy, um, the need and cost of finance and technology, technological advancement all came together. Uh, it was, you know, it was much more by, I think, luck than design. Uh, possibly. Um, and that's what has suddenly driven everything. So technology, as quite rightly pointed out, was there. It was coming. It was coming anyway. But f for example, take if the cost of financing, the, if the base rates hadn't dropped to the level they had, if let's just imagine the world as it was, say, 10 years or 15 years before, mm -hmm. base rates were sitting at 5.5%, I think we would have a different conversation today. So several okay. things came together. All right, so that, 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 confluence, down, that yeah. confluence worked. Let, throw, let's throw in a, an outlier, though. Um, does, the, does the Trump administration throw a spanner into this at all for you guys? Uh, when we look at tariffs on solar, for example. The bus has no. left the station. All right, all right. the bus has left the station. I mean, he station. can do what he likes. Okay. Nothing's going to happen. So where does nuclear fit into this? Some, some will see you as an outlier on this panel. Um, where does nuclear fit in? Why do you think nuclear is the best option for the UAE? Uh, and how does it sit with the rest of the panel here? Thank you, Axel. You know, I would like to just take us you know, a few, I mean, few thousand feet uh, you know, higher. Then I'm going to talk about nuclear. 
First of all, you know, we need to think about, you know, the, there's a debate between renewable, clean energy, fossil fuel. These are all energies will be required for the future. It's, that's reality. You know, the numbers by 2040, we have a, you know, of a growth, you know, in the UAE around 70% of energy demand will be, you know, from electricity. So taking that to basics, you know, that's just when I talk to each individual here in this, uh, this hall, why oil is, is so commoditized and why oil is so important, you know, when it comes to as a commodity. Because it's simply, you know, one uh, cup of this oil, it's transportable, you could put it in a cup, you could transport it anywhere you want, everywhere. And looking at the billions of people who will come and, you know, come through the poverty line and some, you know, best places China has to look at, is we used, they used to have people with a scooter, with a oil, with an, with an engine. Today, scooter is electrical, and that small drop of, of oil, of, of energy is being consumed, is more going from oil toward electrical. So electrification is picking up very, very fast, and unprecedented growth, all the way from you know, our kids at home, each one has one or two devices now that they're consuming energy, electricity, we have the growth in China, as per the IAEA, by 2040, <clears throat> air conditioning electricity load in China will be equivalent to Japan electricity consumption. That gives you a huge number of, of demand on electricity. So electrification is a reality, and it's gonna go, and it's gonna you know, exponentially grow fast. So now we will need all sources of energy, you know, be it nuclear, uh, renewable, and, and the rest of it. There's a lot of demand is there in the market. So looking at the uh, UAE specifically, we had uh, in 2006 a very detailed analysis of our energy mix. And we looked at the future, and we saw this is happening, as Mohammed was mentioning. And we had to come up with solutions, innovative solutions. Nuclear is a, is a, is a base load. It generates a lot of energy in a clean, safe, yep. and reliable manner. Yep. And uh, our policy today, you know, when having four, four reactors will provide around 25% of electricity, they will avoid emission of around 21 million tons of CO2. That's almost a three million cars off the road from a CO2 emissions point of view. So the numbers speak for itself. And I think, I think you've said 6% of, 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 of energy will come from, from nuclear. I think that's 20, the target, is it? 25% by 2021, the nuclear energy will provide okay. that. Uh, okay, let, let me ask you this. Um, you, you've, a lot has been invested in nuclear here. Um, and maybe this is the wrong way of asking it, but I'll do it anyway. Are you threatened in any way when you hear the stories from the other panelists about their own technologies? No, in the contrary. Actually, the demand of electricity, as I said, electrification is going exponentially. And renewable, it's a great complement, you know, with a base load, you know, uh, you know, uh, it mentioned that today, you know, the nuclear power, the solar plants, they could come at the peak and could, you know, uh, avoid these peaks. But also, you know, it complements each other. So now, even with, we still need gas to make electricity because it's a, a proven and, a, and cost and, effici and efficiency of it's going very, very, going great. Uh, renewable is also a good complement. The only bottleneck we have today, and that's reality, and that's why I, I you know, want to go back to the scooter example of the, the small village when people want to be transported. The only challenge they have today, you know, between going from the scooter level, which is now commercially viable and is becoming, you know, the cheapest, it's a small engine, you know, a small motor, very low maintenance. The challenge we have today is storage. So once you break that, uh, you know, there's, you know, some, the person, speaker, about the, what would be a shift of paradigm and breaker technology. If energy storage, you know, gets sold, then this electricity could be put in a cup, could be put in a car, yep. and a very condensed energy. And, but, but that needs to happen from an energy con density point of view and transportability then that will break barriers. Let's, let's, let's look at it from, a, from, a, from another perspective. And I want to get the other panelists' perspective on the way you feel nuclear complements what you're doing. But, um, and I'll, I'll come to you in a second on this one. But this, this idea of a, of a decentralized energy system, um, a, a renewable-fueled decentralized system, where does nuclear fit into that? You know, the... It, let's say, go back to basics. So from, from uh, energy, trans, energy growth or electrification, the growth will need nuclear and beyond nuclear. Nuclear is proven to be a very solid base load of electricity. It, it, it generates a lot of energy, of electricity energy. So you need to complement that with, a, with a renewable. 
And also that if you just throw it as a baseline, as a base load, you need nuclear, you need gas, you need fossil fuel, and some other countries, uh, they don't have regulations with, with, with the environment, coal also viable on that whole basket. So on top of that, you, you need renewable. And renewable is really breaking ground. You know, prices of renewable uh, used to be 40 uh, cents per kilowatt hour 10 years ago. Today, from 40 cents to 2 cents now. Yeah. And thanks to, to our colleague here, breaking the prices. But the challenge is still, on the storage, you know, when the wind is not blowing, when the uh, sun is not there, you need that, you know, break of technology, break it through. If that break it through happens, will yeah. help nuclear, yeah. will help renewable, will help everybody. When, when is that going to happen, Patty? Oh, sorry, so the challenge for nuclear is, is this, right? Um, solar thermal, uh, that's the heat of the sun collected and stored in molten salts, uh, delivering reliable base load type electricity, fluctuating with the demand as required, uh, all of a sudden, 24 hours, so stable. So first of all, renewables is starting to become dispatchable all of a sudden. Mm. That technology came from 15 cents per kilowatt hour, 14 cents per kilowatt hour one year ago to 7.3 cents per kilowatt hour today, okay? Uh, so just imagine that change. It came from 40 cents a few years ago. So look at the rate at which that has dropped. The, the challenge for nuclear is you're taking investment decisions today to recover the capital cost over 60 to 70 years. Well, within six to seven years, the world is upside down in the, in, in the energy sector. Just think what happened in the last six years. Everything is completely changed. What happened to oil? What happened to gas? So that's the challenge. Yeah. So I, I believe uh, the reality is that Nuclear definitely is a reliable base load provider. Mm. It's one, just like gas is uh, a reliable energy provider. Oil was, in the case of electricity. We used to burn oil to produce electricity, by the way, not so long ago. But we wouldn't even dream of it today, just like that. So there you go. Uh, I'll give you the right uh, to reply on that, and then see yeah, I will I'll pick up on that. So uh, I am not a sales pitch. You know, I don't sell, I'm not a sales, I'm a government employee, so I don't want to go with that. <laughs> well, you sales pitch, which is I doubt the economics of it. <laughs> I have the numbers and you know, they've been financed by international banks you know, globally and we have over $4 billion have been invested in our nuclear power plants here in, uh, in Abu Dhabi and I'm really also, you know, we have the Koreans now, they own 18% equity of our uh, power plant, so a few banks are already in this uh, panel here. They know our economics and it's a, a great uh, source of energy and that's why the government is, you know, built four units and that's a great investment that will provide a clean source and uh, reliable uh, source of energy for the country. The, the challenge, again, you know, we go back to is the you know, uh, storage. So that's, I'm not talking about level of, of, of power plants, I'm talking about transportation level, you know, because you know, the huge energy consumption is in transportation and resources. So the economics has to win, make the, you know, the, 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 and technology has to break through to make the economics work. Yep. Because technically if things doesn't work, if you finance it, they're going to happen. You know, that's, that's the most important uh, part. Okay, thank you. Deepa. So it's, at, at the end of the day, it's about an energy mix that we will see. And we yeah. will see that in the next uh, two decades, three decades, that we will have an energy mix. And there will be a fair place for, for nuclear. Will we see more nuclear plants in the world? I don't know. But what we definitely will see, and that is what we can all see happening here in the region, but elsewhere, everywhere, that uh, all the, the, the renewable plants are growing on a massive rate. And, and that's also what happens here in the region. We have at the moment 40 gigawatt installed that goes uh, up to some estimates. We regionally, uh, we, we pub uh, published recently a study uh, goes up to 100 gigawatts in the next 15 years. So that's, that's a massive undertaking that we do. And, and, and uh, I think that will uh, show the pace that we have in this energy system. That is a transition that we are living through. And there we have, of course, much more technology development in the near uh, time also that we see. And there we will see also a lot of things in terms of uh, storage. Like uh, Paddy was <coughs> describing, I think uh, that's a fair way to, to schedule such a plant today already like you schedule a, a fossil plant and you are yeah. doing that. Mm -hmm. You are operating such a plant. But there are other ways also where we come to the point that you really can transport the energy. For example, we recently introduced also here in the UAE hydrogen as an energy storage. So you generate with solar power, you generate hydrogen. And hydrogen you take then as either a fuel for gas turbines, you can take it in a, in a, in a gas cylinder and then can put it in a fuel cell car, or you do other things with it. So there is mechanisms which will scale up also in the, in the future. This is today also a technology that is not 
very well developed in the sense that it's already mature. But it's a base technology that will come. Yeah. All right. Look, but before, before we go, I want to come back to um, uh, uh, investment cases and some of the challenges you see. But I'd, I'd also like you to share some of, some of the, the, the ideas that, that excite you most. Uh, in the sector, and and, and let, let me let me start with uh, you, uh, Mr. Al Ramahi. Um, what what do you what do you what are, uh, as I said at the beginning, some real eye popping numbers can be thrown out in this space that that will impress and maybe sway that thirty six percent a little bit. What can you throw out there that Mazdar is excited about right now? Let's throw a couple of numbers. One point two billion people around the world still either have. Uh, lousy, uh, bad electricity source coming into their households, or they don't have power at all. 1.2 billion. So we're not even there yet. So the growth uh, of energy demand across the globe will continue. And renewables will play a very important role. We are talking about uh, f 50 to 80 gigawatt of solar power generation installed capacity on an annual basis in the next six years. And this is a report done by the International Renewable Energy Agency based here in Abu Dhabi and in Mazdar City. So when we talk about energy, we don't talk about sustainability of energy. We talk about sustainability of everything. And when we saw the, uh, earlier the presentation from the doctor talking about the, 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 the demand for oil in the future, it's not about only renewable energy penetration. Uh, it is about mobility, it's about water, it's about urban development, it's about energy efficiency. All of these elements contributes to the future demand of oil. So it's not one element, which is renewable energy or nuclear power generation, what we call clean energy. So all of these elements play a very important role. Distributed solar will play an extremely important role in the future. We have seen in the past 10 years, a lot of companies being incubated uh, across the world, focusing on distributed solar. So they go to villages across the world and build distributed solar capacity using future technologies, using the mobile apps, uh, GSM networks, without the, the large scale infrastructure grids that is currently required to push through energy capacity uh, uh, globally. So we see a lot of growth, we see a lot of opportunities, we see next to me, and I have to say, I have to say that, uh, not because we work closely with GE and Siemens, but because of GE and Siemens, because of such companies, we are able, we are able to put on the grid power projects with highly efficiency power projects. That is bankable by this financial community. Yeah. For example, in the UK, when we started our offshore wind, we started with 1.6 megawatt turbines, Siemens turbines. The second project that we have done, six megawatt uh, Siemens turbines. After five years, we are looking at 15 megawatt offshore wind turbines, potentially 18 megawatt. What does it mean? It means higher efficiency, less infrastructure, lower cost. Mana, you have, you're the head of GE Renewables, I, I believe, has said the region or the UAE, I think, is, it was, 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 was what he said, needs 30 to 40 billion US dollars of investment of capital, of capital to hit those targets, those 2035 targets. Um, is, that, is that doable when we talk about the, the money out there, the capital out there, the sort of feedback you're getting from investors and potential investors? And it, one, is that doable? And two, where are you putting your money right now? So absolutely, it is doable. The region need today around 180 gigawatt in the next coming five years. There is a clear line of sight to 120 with the type of technology. The reason they didn't define the whole 180 gigawatt because this technology and the energy, you know, the energy sector is changing on a daily basis that you don't know exactly how to calculate what type of energy and what's going to be the cost that you're going to go after it. Today, we're at a stage that we're reimagining the whole power sector. 
today there are four segments that every industry is looking at. You're looking at decarbonization because that's having a huge impact. And you have a lot of different technologies that is actually making it more difficult to make the decision. You're looking at digitization, which is everyone is moving toward digital economy. So around 25% of the world is going to be running by digital economy by 2025. And how can you utilize digital to help you do your renewable energy better? How can you have that forecast to reduce the downtime, to improve the cost and know exactly where to put it and how can you improve it? You're looking at the decentralization, which is something completely different. Yeah. You still need the other sources of energy. This is part of sustainability. You still need it. But we're seeing a new trend that we didn't see before, that the end consumer now are the customers. You're seeing there is around 100 gigawatt of installed capacity of remote power across the world. By 2030, that's going to go to 330 gigawatt. And today, they're using renewable. Mm. And as Mr. Mohammed said, you really don't need that grid connection now. The technology is evolving in an unbelievable way with storage that you really don't need it. And finally, the electrification, everything in the system. So are you going to see in five years regular car in Dubai? I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, things are is moving and evolving in an unbelievable way. Where I would focus the most is where the game changer in that technology is the storage. The storage. This is what make or break that technology. Yeah. Today, yeah. the technology we're introducing, a new technology, not only us, but us, others as well, on an annual basis. You know, every day you have a new technology that's been introduced that's mainly driving the price down. Today, it's more competitive than fossil fuel. It's more competitive than anything else. I mean, we, we were having these conversations about batteries for EVs some years ago. Um, and, you know, we talked about the underestimating the ingenuity of man back then. Yeah. Um, how quickly is it going to happen, the storage? How quickly are you going to solve this storage problem? We talked about s thermal solar, but, but uh, w w what it do you think? It is coming. It is coming. We're already actually looking at it by this year for small scale, not large scale, but we're developing things for large scale. So in less than two years, you're going to have storage systems. But back, back to what we just heard from Mazda. I mean, how, how soon before this stuff is really bankable? before the investors in this room can look at it and say, that's where I'm putting my money. That's there are, there are two types of yeah, yeah. storage. Uh, and there are multi-technologies in terms of storage. If we talk about storage related to utilities, there are thermal storage and there is electric storage. My colleague Paddy mentioned thermal storage, which is currently used bankable. with the concentrated solar power, mm. which is bankable. Yep. And there is the electric storage, which my colleague uh, from GE has mentioned the using electric storage for large scale utilities. This is also bankable. bankable. So we this is also bankable. The, 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 the issue here with electric storage at a large scale uh, is still the cost. We have seen a massive drop of the cost over the past uh, five years on electric battery storage, almost 60% cost drop. And we anticipate also another 30 to 40 percent cost drop on the battery storage over the next five years okay. which will of course fuel the growth of renewable energy solar or wind coupled with large-scale utility storage this is also uh, important to note that this acceleration of cost reduction on storage is coupled with the growth in ev which is the doctor, we've heard them earlier in the morning mentioning the electric vehicles penetration and the growth of the EV sector. So the EV sector uses similar technologies of large-scale battery uh, technology on utilities, mm -hmm. and this is fueling the growth. So we see more manufacturing uh, uh, investments in uh, battery storage worldwide. Okay. And we saw a couple of fabs being commissioned this year Large, large, including Tesla is one of them, Panasonic, and some of the other major players. Okay, w w one second, Barry. Let Mr. Amari, yeah, let's would, come to uh, you quickly. Yes, I would like to, you know, I, I may be back to defer with some of the statements was mentioned earlier. I would like to take us also back to basics. Today, if we talk about the current batteries available today, uh, if anybody want to Google, Google uh, Tesla car battery, you know, and just look at the images, and we'll give you how big these batteries are. You know, a Tesla car, from bumper to bumper, when you sit in the driver's car, it's all batteries throughout the whole car. So this is shows the uh, opportunity and the limitation of the current batteries that we have right now. Tesla is one of the most innovative companies in the world, and they still cannot break the current you know, technology. There is 
a lot of investment all over the place, mm -hmm. in the, you know, big labs in the US and others, government funded, not private, to make to break through this you know, nickel cadmium battery. So we have a limitation there. I don't expect anything in the next two to three years, definitely nothing gonna happen. It's gonna take much longer than that. And always goes to transportability of energy. And that's, that's, the, that's the key game, game changer. Another item, another you know, angle also, and maybe my colleague here, Detmer, could talk about is the constraint we have right now with networks. The current grids, with they, grids. Are, yeah. they are designed in a very old fashioned way. And they are made in a very, you know, the way Star Investment, these are heavy infrastructure. When they are not, you know, easily bankable because they need to, you know, stay for, the, for a long time. Grid of network of electricity. And these are, the basic physics is the same, but the, between AI and, you know, artificial intelligence and digitization was mentioned also by my colleague from GE. This needs has to break through and has to be adopted on a bigger scale to make things much more uh, agile and much more dynamic to transport in that grid. And this is what, I know you wanted to say something on the storage, but this is one of the challenges, right? I absolutely end on the storage. Okay, so it is, you're absolutely right, Mohammed. It's correct to acknowledge the fact that a 24-hour battery has not yet been invented even, okay? So the battery that is coming down in cost, and it's still fairly expensive, and not come down to the utility scale in a significant way, is the one that can store electricity for two to a maximum of six hours. Uh, and that will continue to come down and we'll get there. But thermal storage is very bankable, 24 hours we are doing it. Right now we are in the middle of banking a three and a half billion US dollar uh, a project, renewable energy project, the largest renewable energy project in the world. Um, and no problem, it can be banked. Um, so bankability is not a problem for storage, uh, all of this will work. I think we're getting too stuck on um, limiting our imagination to say until battery storage is resolved, um, renewables is gonna be a problem. Uh, I don't believe it because I think we are not recognizing the phenomenal uh, changes that are already happening. Technology again is leading the way. Long distance DC transmission that's already becoming so cost competitive. Couple of cents per kilowatt hour to move electricity across thousands of kilometers. That coupled with distributed generation with central generation Multiple technology integrating. By the way, people don't realize, but there are many, many sites across the world where the good Lord was always looking after us. It's sunshine during the day and the wind blows at night. So you put the two together, you don't require a hell of a lot of storage. So once you start integrating all of this with long distance trans transmission and even our current grid enhanced with solid state stuff that again technology is giving us, with little additions to be able to deal with intermittency and fluctuations. I think you're gonna see within the next 10 years a phenomenal change whether battery is there or not, okay. whether battery catches up. It's of no relevance. Is it, is it worth? Agreed, agreed with both of you. I yep. mean, the investments need to go also in the grids. The investments will come to the grids and there will be things that we see also in terms of digitalization. Also, uh, I would agree to the DC transmission, yeah. but digitalization plays uh, a, a different role also in the future in terms of predictability. How can you schedule your plant? Yeah. So making a forecast on your solar plant, how can I schedule my solar power? This is also a kind of storage. Today we are, uh, the time lag that we have between scheduling such a plant and really bringing it to the grid is a, long, is a long time. And this will shorten also by digitalization. So all these technologies will emerge at the end of the day and come together. And don't forget, you're gonna have millions of batteries out there that are gonna be running around as cars. Okay, so that's all that's gonna happen in the next 10 years. Yep. So all of a sudden, you're gonna have distributed uh, generators, you're gonna have all the cars as batteries, we're all gonna come in and, and plug in and provide us with that storage. So the electrical, electricity landscape will completely be different. It's already starting to be different. It will be unrecognizable. Is it, is it worth us having the, the, the solar versus wind uh, 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 debate? Um, I mean, I, I imagine it depends hugely on where you are, exactly. what part of the world you're, you're in. But so they complement each other. They, they complement each other. And that depends on, so previously in this part of the world, everyone used to think solar. Solar is the way to go. Saudi Arabia, a few, you know, they announced their strategy two years ago in which they said we're going to go solar 70% and win 30%. They flipped that the other way around today because of the efficiency. So they come with two different, complete different models. Each one is different. They complement each other. As Paddy said, this region is blessed by the best sun and best wind as well. You have wind speed in this part of the world that reach 10 meters per second. 
which is fantastic. Yeah. You don't have this in even the US or Europe or anyone else. And that indicates the higher the wind, the better efficiency, the more amount of electricity you're going to be able to generate. So today it's all about new business model. It's not competing. It's actually how can you complement specifically for this part of the world? How can you do a hybrid or even co-located where you're using the best of the sun in the daytime, using wind throughout the day and night, that actually add value to you and drive your LCOE down? Mm -hmm. Look, it's, it's very hard to play, for me to play devil's advocate in this discussion because I, I, I find all of this extremely exciting. Um, um, and, you know, I have children of my own who are going to, be, uh, are going to have to deal with, with this in the future. But, but let, let's talk a, a little bit more about some of the, some of the challenges out there. And, and, and I, I, I was thrown a few things, price distortion. Uh, phasing out energy and utility subsidies as one of them, the need to strengthen the investment policy framework, better engagement with the financial system. I, I want to come back to that one, the scaling up of green bonds, for example, and then continued investment and the right investment in R&D. What, what, let me start with you, Mohammed. What, what, what do you see as the, the, the biggest obstacles or the, the potential to upset this apple cart? The main challenge remains the same. Uh, regulations and policy, technology, and financing. I think these three main elements has been in the past as a challenge, and they continue to be a challenge, I believe, uh, in the future. Uh, regulation and policy is, is, is essential, and the change uh, of regulation and policy is also essential. So sometimes you get attracted to a regulation or a regime, and then you invest as a direct uh, international investor, and then suddenly these countries decide to change regulations and policy while you are constructing or after you start operating the plant. That's damaging. I mean, this continues to be a major challenge. And technology. We would like uh, Siemens and GE and other technology providers to to push more into R&D, to provide us with solutions that are more efficient. Uh, that is, of course, uh, something that they need to commit and, to. The, yep. And then, Sorry. when we find the technology that is uh, what we believe that is practical and, and should be uh, implemented, the lenders and the bankers need to make sure that it is bankable. Mm. Because what we have also faced in the past years is we have an excellent solution, or what we believe, our engineers, our researchers believe that this is the best technological solution, but then the banks would say, did we finance this in the past? No, we don't like it. Mm -hmm. All right, I want to look at both of those things. And let's start with the R&D, and then we'll come, we'll come to the investors. Um, the G, to GE and to Siemens, is it, is it still a battle to sell this business case, this sustainability premium to your chief financial officer and to the money people at the top of the company? No, I don't think so. We're at no? that stage. No, not at all. I think so today we're a technology-driven company. We're mainly an equipment and technology. So we need to be able, this is our bread and butter, we need to be able to introduce new technologies for each market technologies that are driving us to actually get a better market share. Today, when you speak about renewable, the name of the game is the price. Yeah. That's the end of it. It's the price. It's the lowest LCOE. So what kind of new technology are you going to be able to introduce that will help you to achieve that LCOE that you're going after and to be more competitive? That's one. Number two is actually how can you customize and have this forecast for the next five years? So today, what hurted the conventional power sector is that unclarity in the forecast. They didn't see renewable coming in that speed. So it hurted them. So as we need to learn from that lesson, <clears throat> as we develop the technologies and continue investing, because as I mentioned, the wind industry specifically, you have a technology every year and you have two MPIs in the middle of the year. MPIs that mean you're increasing your hub height, your rotor diameter, which is still another development that require a lot of R&D, a lot of engineering, a lot of product people to work on. And that's the trend across the industry. And you have to continue in that momentum. You cannot stop. 
But how can you use the other enablers to help you? Right. The digital, how can you use the 3D printing, the additive, as an enabler to help you build that strong business case? But how, how do you respond to Mazda when, when, when you hear, we want the G's and the Siemens to put more into R&D and to move a little bit faster, et cetera, et cetera? I echo, I echo what he's saying. We need to be faster. We need to do things different, but there is a process. Sometimes you wish I have a magic torch to say, I want it to happen in one day, but there is a process. Sometimes, as you mentioned, regulation sometimes can be a bottleneck. Yeah. So sometimes, even if you invent and do things, but there are certain regulation that holds your hand that you cannot move you know, beyond that. Okay, but so, the bottlenecks don't include the, the, the CFOs and some of the, the upper management in these companies market, who are still skeptical maybe. Once you see a market and once they see, it's, it doesn't take too much time. It's, you see the market, you see the growth, it's easy to make a decision. Okay. So we, we are definitely, we made a bet on, on that, of course, we are in renewables, we have uh, the biggest uh, installed uh, capacity in wind in the world, together with our partners here, uh, also on the, on the, on the podium, uh, and we are doing that and we continue to invest into that here. We have last, last year, we had the biggest capacity addition in, in wind power as a single company, which we brought to the market, and we will also do all the things in R&D, and you know it also, Mohammed, that we are continuing to invest in that, to do everything, to have the technology also of the future. So we see, and that is what I said earlier, in this region, but also in the whole world, that the renewables will grow and there is no doubt about that, that we will also continue to bring new technologies uh, in all aspects, in, in terms of generation, but also in terms of storage to the market and contribute so that we also have altogether a, a sustainable mankind future. We also do this uh, inside our company, by the way. Sustainability means not only that we talk about sustainability towards the market and uh, talk about economic economic solutions to the market, it also means that we as a company have committed to be uh, 2030 completely CO2 free. That means that all our plants and all our things will run also energy efficient. That means also that we have to invest by ourselves into this industry. So right. our right. CFO has no problem with that. Back to your yeah, question. Go ahead, Pat. Go ahead, Pat. So, well, sorry to be blunt and no disrespect to anybody. Uh, policy is almost become irrelevant uh, because renewables is cost comp competitive and it's a compelling value proposition. So it's mainstream. So it just is moving. Um, I am not so concerned about technology. I think you're absolutely right. Private companies will continue. To, uh, they see the opportunity. They're going to jump in, and they're going to continue to invest, and they're going to continue to. And we're seeing it. Uh, look at the pace at which technology is galloping. Financing is going to become a bigger challenge for a very simple reason. Renewable energy is capex heavy, right. opex light, zero fuel cost. Okay, so it does consume a significant amount. The 190 billion, uh, sorry, 90 uh, gigawatt uh, growth that is expected in this region is going to be about a 270 billion US dollar investment need. Banks un can no longer provide that long-term financing because they've also got their regulatory burdens. Mm -hmm. At last, you know, they've got to think about matching assets and liabilities. So we're going to start to look at beyond the banks, banks as shorter term capital providers, yeah. okay. looking at other pools of liquidity. Um, yes, uh, the insurance companies, the pension funds, bond structures. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I want to pick up on the bond structures. Other, yeah, all sorts of other forms. I mean, so I, that's where the challenge is going to be. So if there is going to be any limitation to this panacea uh, of phenomenal change and everything utopia, it will be the ability for money to come into that. Not because it's not attractive, mm -hmm. not because it's not safe, <clears throat> not because it's not unbankable, but simply because of the amount, the sheer volume of money that is uh, going to have to come in fairly quickly. The, the, you know, we talk about green bonds, um, and it's something we hear more and more about. Um, and I imagine these work because they reduce the, the, the capital cost for projects like these. Um, I, I think it's a thing. Will, will, is, it green, is it something like green bonds that are going to provide the, the competitive edge for, for renewables? I mean, is that a solution, do you, do you think, anyone? Uh, well, uh, uh, sorry, I, you know, I will uh, comment on this one, but um, also give a twist on, you know, on, the, on, the, on the size and share, because now we are talking about uh, you know, the tip of the iceberg. When it comes to investment in the utility sector, because this is not just, you know, you don't just plug, you know, an up a power plant, it's just, it's a one piece of the bigger equation. So, you know, private bankers and private sector, you don't see the uh, sheer size and volume 
with this investment. You know, there is a transmission network, there is a distribution network, there's, and this is, has to be a very healthy network, which is technically speaking, has to be, heartbeat has to be good, the, you know, the blood pressure of the network has to be good for it to operate. And today, when it comes to the power plant business, you know, we have the gas plants, we have the, you know, also conventional sources of energy. And today, renewable is still, you know, a s small piece comparatively to the, you know, if you talk global, you know, generation. So, the tail will not walk the dog, you know, just to be clear. So, it's a small piece. It's going to grow, definitely, and it has the right potential for it. But it is still a growing, you know, pain, you know, in the change of the, of the transmission network and the utility business. To Mohammed's point about the policies, yes, I think policies are lagging behind. There is a big change need to happen, you know, systematically and throughout the whole network, from generation to transmission to distribution, need to be completely re reconfigured between digitization, between new equipment, between smart networks. But not going to happen over a few weeks or a few years. This has started already, you know, 10 years ago. But the pace of change of it, it's slow for one simple reason. Uh, policies need to catch up. But also the investment we invested in, you know, on the grid, it's not a two or five years. This is not a telecom network. This is an electricity network. It takes a 30 years to, you know, to get these networks kind of uh, become obsolete. Some of them even last for 40 years. So that it will take. So patience required from the business, business savvy people to understand and not to compare this with telecom business. This is electricity business with the, uh, you know, it's, it's a long-term investment. So to go back on the green bond, I'm frankly, you know, from my side, I, I put, wear my hat as an engineer and as a technologist and a businessman. The subsidy did re really hurt the renewable energy and help it because it made it, you know, uh, become dependent on, a, on a, you know, an injection than actually being competitive. Today, you know, it is competitive. If this happened earlier, that breakthrough technology and break of capital costs happened earlier, could they really get a bigger, bigger boost and a bigger lion's share? So if I'm, I'm as an electric engineer, I would love to see you know, this technology breaking through much earlier. Yeah. Because yeah. once that happens, they make the policymaker change their thinking and change their mindset. Today in, in the UAE and Abu Dhabi specifically, we saw this in 2006 and 2007. We, we did develop diversified policy. And MASTER was initiated and, and, and launched. Uh, the nuclear project was launched, and many initiatives were launched you know, in that uh, venue to be able to tap into all those sources of, of energies. No specific to all would depend on technical viability, and second comes economics. All right, um, look, I'm, I'm wary of the time. I've got a couple of, a couple of other things I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask, but I want to go to our audience first to see if there are any questions uh, in the audience. Um, yeah, and there, I know there are microphones floating around, and there's a gentleman right here. Uh, Microphone four, I think is what I'm supposed to say. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, uh, alternative energy, these uh, re renewables is definitely going to be a big uh, I mean, opportunity for uh, investors going forward because we, we have seen that uh, the uh, influence of uh, conventional fuels is going to decline. But uh, I would like to know in the value chain of the uh, various uh, alternative uh, sources of uh, energy, like uh, which are the most uh, profitable ones an investor can think of investing? Like, is it the equipment makers like uh, Siemens and GE? Or should an investor look at uh, investing in, uh, in, say, utilities, expecting that, okay, and if you can share some of the, uh, like, for example, a market share of some of the good companies? Because I have uh, some investors who want to invest in clean energy, and there is one ETF uh, in the US called the Clean Energy ETF. If you look at the, the performance of the ETF, it is very pathetic uh, over the last uh, five years. So, I mean, uh, I can just tell my investors that uh, uh, alternate energy is for the future, but I myself don't have much idea about like uh, uh, what uh, exactly, which segment to focus uh, from an investment point of view, like in terms of like uh, uh, there should be good uh, pricing, there should be good return on investment, not so capital intensive <coughs> as, as Paddy was saying. If you can share All that. right, thank you. So where are you going to get the biggest bang for your buck, I guess, is the question here. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Well, Patty, so let's start. No, 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 go ahead, Mana. Yeah. Go, go ahead. So, so the way when you look at any yeah. renewable investment, there are five different things that you look at. One of them is the turbine cost. One of them is the service, which is controlled by the manufacturer. Then after that, you have the IRR expectation, the cost of finance, and development fees. So each one of them play a role. But if you're asking specifically who makes the money, I think Samia and Paddy are going to have an argument. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, sorry. Okay. Look, the, the reality is risk rewards. So the first message, forget about this being a speculative 
high return investment. It's utility services, so what do you expect? So if you, if you want stable long-term returns, invest in the delivery side, the, the asset, the, the power plant side of the business. If you want speculative investment, go invest in the mining company that's mining for cobalt in Democratic Republic of Congo and take your chances. Mm. Um, mm. So mm. It's, it's a continuum. Uh, so it, it is, but I think the biggest shock to the investor community out there is they looked at renewable energy till, well, they are still looking at it, some of them, that's the mistake, but certainly till sort of three or four years ago as a high risk, high reward, potentially high loss uh, industry. It just, and in the early days, they did make phenomenal returns, but then they kind of continued to pour money in thinking that, not recognizing that it has now become mainstream. So the returns have all dropped. There were power plants being developed in Europe, in the United States, power plants, 20 year supply contracts at 22, 24% rate of returns. Crazy. But that's because they managed to fool the world into believing that it was some exotic technology, unreliable, who knows what the risk is. And maybe the buyer will change his mind. And by the way, in many instances, the buyer did change the mind. So probably they did uh, sort of need that 24% return. But that story is very different today. It's mainstream, so why should it be anything more than 8%, 7% return for stable, long-term uh, investments? All right. All right, very good. Uh, let's have another question. Yep, right over here, number one. Barry, picking you up uh, on that uh, comment you made about financing challenges and how the banks may prove to be inadequate, uh, but it's also a general question and comment to the panel. Uh, uh, would you see, you know, sector specific, namely, say, you know, the power finance corporations, infrastructure financing companies, infrastructure investment companies, where there is a, you know, it's a joint sector initiative between the government owned entities and the, uh, you know, private sector, but not necessarily private sector in terms of the retail investors, but, you know, across the value chain. How do you see it panning out? Because, you know, the demand is going to be there, the requirements are going to be there, the financing are going to be there. You know, there are fiscal challenges in terms of, you know, the governments can't keep pumping and investing billions of dollars uh, year on year. So where do you see this panning out? I mean, that's a question for the panel. Yeah. Just, just a quick one. So the, uh, already the pensions industry and the insurance industry, I know, is very busy re-looking at their uh, regulations to allow uh, a bigger capital location to come into uh, infrastructure. Because they, have, they want to get out of the volatile they want to get, Yeah, sector. because they've also, right. exactly, yeah. and they've also been constrained. You know, right now they're property heavy, oil sector heavy, so they're looking at, and so we remain optimistic that that will free up a significant amount of capital. But no question for this part of the world, the sovereign wealth funds, which are sitting on uh, enormous amounts of uh, capital, which are just now uh, out there in bonds and equities, uh, they need to start looking at, uh, you're absolutely right, they should be looking at creating partnerships where they give the confidence. So uh, one of the regional sovereign wealth funds steps up and says, look, let me put X and you come and co-invest. I am in this part of the world, so I provide that risk mitigation and create the multiplier effect to attract uh, other capital from uh, I think I'm right pool. in saying Saudi's PIF is taking a 10% stake in your company, right? We are in discussion. They already own 12%, uh, by the way, uh, and I think it is in the public domain that okay, there's so a discussion uh, around an increase in that. All right. Um, As an example, yes. Okay. Sorry, I didn't want to put you on the spot with That's that. That's okay. No problem. <laughs> Break some news here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm really uh, very pleased to hear that the capacity of electricity will be uh, either from green or uh, conventional will be available and there's huge investment and growth in that side. But my question about innovation in electricity, I did hear um, there's some, one is working on software or developing technology that in the future would enable us to receive electricity in Wi-Fi, uh, like a telecommunication. Yes. 
Can someone elaborate and uh, update us on how it, this is going to be? Because this is one, when someone mentioned uh, Muhammad, 1.2 billion people, they need electricity. Imagine that if I am in a remote area, I receive electricity as I receive a telephone call. Or Okay. So I, I, I would comment on this, you know, this was my, you know, my professor, God bless his soul, he passed away, you know, he was doing this for, this research project for, he died when he was 95 and he still was in the lab, by the way. So that technology was, you know, and is still being evaluated, but, you know, nothing, you know, break through uh, that technology and from it. So not going to happen soon. Uh, there you've seen, uh, how many of you have watched the, you know, the sci-fi movies when somebody comes with a zap, zap or laser gun, you know, and shoots somebody? That's, that gun, it's, it's a 25 megawatt energy with one zap, you know, to, to evaporate something. So that technology, you know, it's in the science fiction, nothing of it yet uh, in the real world. Okay. What, what we have today is technology. We are testing that, some, for example, charging wirelessly bus systems. For example, yeah. electric buses, you drive over a road and you charge this bus wirelessly while it's driving over the road. That's uh, not commercialized yet. It's in the test labs, but uh, we will soon also commercialize that. That will come maybe for electric cars. So while they are driving on the road, they will charge. Uh, so these, te these technologies will evolve, but they are not yet ready for the market. And may, I may, I think I've mentioned, maybe I mentioned earlier that uh, decentralized uh, uh, solar uh, power generation across different villages off-grid using GSM network. The GSM network is being used today as a billing mechanism. Yeah, yeah. So basically the, the installer of these solutions across these villages they get their money through GSM network. So prepaid, they use the GSM network through prepaid uh, SIMs to uh, uh, basically control uh, the power within these households. But we are, of course, we are still a long way for uh, uh, powering uh, things or gadgets through Wi-Fi or... Uh, yeah, but, but, you know, yeah, and it's, it's, it's happening. So you it's can see your, you, you know, your phone now charges without a wire. But, Correct. You know, but that's... Still very, very, very small and very in advance. So if, if you allow me just to, uh, you know, just to, uh, I don't want to recap on behalf, you know, just, <laughs> uh, you know, on, on, we need to make sure that the bankers are on the sun, that, that, you know, there's good discussion on this panel, but also you need, still need to finance the gas plants, please. So we need that uh, to be there. <laughs> we need to finance the, you know, renewable project. We need to finance the nuclear project because the growth, as I said, by 2040, just in UAE, it's talking about around 70% of electricity demand the growth. So there's a lot of business opportunities, a lot of, a lot of you know, business. So don't be, you know, kind of, a, you know, it depends on the risk of the project, as, you know, Paddy yeah. mentioned. Yeah, all right. It depends on how much you want to spend on that. Uh, and, yeah. you know. Okay, uh, look, um, I, I, I'm looking at the time clock. Yeah. I've got a couple of minutes. I, I want to, apologies, I can't come to any more questions. I've got one final question I'm going to ask each of you. It's a, it's, it's a broad one, but it, it, it's a sort of two-parter, really. I, I, I wonder if you feel the accepted renewables are now ripe for their own disruption. You know, to, what it, to how far have we come now along this path? And let me wrap that into this question. When, when are we going to be sit, which GFMF forum are we going to be sitting at with you guys on the stage and you're the mainstream uh, energy people and these disruptors are going to be a panel um, later on in the day? When, when does that happen? Which year? Five years. Five years from now? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah? yeah. Five years. Five years? Yeah. 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 Wow. Uh, I would smile, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks we'll 10. Let's be honest. You think 10. <laughs> he thinks 10, right? Let's be honest. You know, I, you know there is, there is a, again, a go, Google, your, Google, you know, Google your Tesla car and see the battery size. One that you know, becomes, uh, the, the battery car and the car becomes the same size of the, your uh, you know, gasoline car or the petrol car. The same, same tank, same size, and can fill the same time from energy transfer point of view, mm -hmm. then that breakthrough will happen. I still that's, all right, that's, uh, all right. 20, 2023, everyone, we'll be sitting here and we'll hold Paddy to this. Uh, thank you very much indeed to uh, all of our panel. That was a, a, a fascinating discussion. And thank, thank you. you to our audience for your questions. Thanks very thank much. You. <laughs> that was good. Thanks, Paddy. I appreciate it.